Okay. Now, let us talk about the this fundamental units which are called the building blocks of the molecules of life. Okay. We will start with the proteins, uh, uh, proteins where the building blocks last time we have told that the building blocks are amino acids, but only amino acids is not sufficient to say the amino acids have to be alpha amino acids number 1. Number 2 is that they have a special stereochemistry and that is L that is designated as capital L amino acids. Remember capital L does not mean liberatory, capital L is the notation used for absolute configuration and um, except glycine, glycine does not have any side chain and uh, other 19 amino acids belong to the L category. And if you want to convert it into the RS nomenclature system, then what happens that out of this 19, 18 belong to the S configuration and only 16 because of a priority changeover, priority order changeover, the 16 L 16 becomes R 16. Okay. So, 18 are basically S amino acids. Why I am saying this is because sometimes it is difficult for you to write uh, the D L uh, system, but it is much easier to show the R S. So, if I ask you to write a L amino acid or L I mean different L amino acid containing peptides very quickly, then the best way to do it is to just check the R S system of the alpha carbon. Remember that the alpha carbon is the one which is the, uh, the chirality center. However, there are there are few other uh, few other slight number not many few other amino acids where there is additional uh, chiral center. I could remember one at least right now and that is called threonine that has got an additional chiral center, uh, but mostly it is only one chiral center and that is present uh, at the alpha position. So, what is an alpha amino acid? Again I repeat last time we told this that alpha amino acids have a NH 2 at one carbon and the other carbon is attached to a carboxy and alongside with that you have a R group. Now, this is uh, has to be L configuration. So, if you want to make it L you quickly make it try to make it S configuration uh, S configuration by writing the hydrogen. Now, the hydrogen can be beta or it can be alpha. So, which way it will be? You know that priority sequence nitrogen takes the number 1, this is the number 2 and the alkyl group takes the number 3, except in case of again I repeat except in case of cysteine, where there is a sulfur which alters the, the sequence. Now, forget about cysteine, consider the other 18 amino acids, where uh, these are all S. So, to make it S, the hydrogen has to be alpha. Okay. So, this is the general structure of uh, L amino acid. Now, de depending on the nature of R, you have different classes of amino acids. What are those classes? Some are called neutral, uh, some are called neutral nonpolar, nonpolar. Okay. So, that means they have that the classification is based on this part only, because that is the part which is varying in different amino acids. Uh, in each 2 is there for all amino acids except again another amino acid is there which is called proline, where this is in H and not in H 2. So, that is a secondary amine. So, the only secondary amine containing amino acid is proline. Okay. Now, this R can be non-polar side chain. So, they are called neutral nonpolar side chain uh, nonpolar amino acids and I will show you that there is a uh, this is the the largest pool of the amino acids. Uh, now, remember another thing I should point out that what we are discussing is the building blocks which makes the protein. We are not talking about the amino acids which are not joined together to make the protein. So, these are called 
protein amino acids. So, we are talking about protein amino acids. How many protein amino acids are there? We know that there are 20 protein amino acids, okay. but if we say how many amino acids are there in nature, then that is thousands and thousands, because there are different types of amino acids which are present, which are not joined together to make the proteins. So, the question has to be very clearly understood that what is asked for that how many non protein amino acids are present in nature, then it is thousands. How many protein amino acids are present in nature, then it is 20. And if it is said that how many amino acids are present, again it is it is thousands countless. Okay. We are talking about only the amino acids which are present in proteins. Okay. These amino acids are 20 in number, they are classified according to the nature of R. If R is non-polar side chain, then that is called neutral non-polar amino acids. Okay. Then we have that R could be groups which can form with an ability to form hydrogen bond. To form hydrogen bond. Okay. So, they are again neutral. Now, neutral means we are talking about the charge present in R that is our classification of neutrality. Okay. We are not talking about this N H 2 and C O 2 H obviously, they can be ionized. Uh, so, our neutrality is based on this side chain R. So, groups with an ability to form hydrogen bond. So, there are amino acids which contains O H that will be the uh, primary member the name of that amino acids is serine or threonine or there could be amino acids which are called asparagine and another is glutamine uh, they are amide they also have the ability to form hydrogen bonds okay but they are uncharged groups remember they are uncharged when i say neutral that means they are uncharged you can have r which is basic in nature groups which are basic in nature and amongst this there are three amino acids one is the lysine another is your arginine and the third one is histidine these are the three basic amino acids okay and then you have acidic r group acidic in nature Acidic in nature means we are talking about strongly acidic in nature, not weakly acidic that means the carboxylic acids and in this there are two amino acids are there one is aspartic acid and the other is glutamic acid. Okay. So, we have one is this non-polar amino acids, these are also called hydrophobic amino acids, non-polar means they will not like water. This is the one which can form hydrogen bond. So, they like water, but their interactions is through hydrogen bond. Then the third class is the basic in nature, where there is a basic group attached to the R and um, the other is the acidic amino acids, where R contains a carboxylic acid functionality. Now, this is one way of classification. You can have other ways of classification. You can have aromatic amino acids, you can have aliphatic amino acids. Uh, those are another uh, like here, you can again sub branch it aliphatic and aromatic. Now, there are three aromatic amino acids one is called phenylalanine, another is tyrosine and the third one is tryptophan. Okay. They are all hydrophobic in nature, however, one must remember that there is an index of hydrophobicity. How much hydrophobic, how much they will be water repellent huh? that depends on the nature of the group. Like if I take tyrosine and phenylalanine, now tyrosine has an R group which is weighs here a para hydroxy and then a CH 2 and then NH 2 and CO 2 H. Now, when we write these structures, we generally now do not write the three dimensional structure, because we assume that this is in the L configuration and phenylalanine is lacking that hydroxy group. Okay. So, obviously, 
we know that which is phenolic which is slightly acidic. So, the hydrophobicity of these two amino acids will definitely be different. Okay. So, that is what I was pointing out that the hydrophobicity that is the hydrophobicity index of all these side chains huh? and, uh, and depending on that when you have a number of amino acids uh, then you have to basically this hydrophobicity they can they can add up together and finally, make it extremely hydrophobic. Uh, so, different amino acids have different solubility profile at different pHs of solution and that all depends on their the characteristics of the groups of NH2, the CO2H and the R. Okay. So, these are the three important groups. Okay. Now, um, let me show you the talk about this first this NH2 and CO2H. We know that the carboxy um, carboxylic this is an acid group and this is a basic group. So, first thing that comes into mind that uh, if you forget about R that this is basically an amphoteric system that it has got a basic group and an acid group. The question is both will affect each other there is a NH2 there is a CO2H that is not same as a molecule which is only having carboxylic acid and that is also not same with the molecule which is only having the amine. That means, what I am pointing out is that whether the acid strength or the basic strength whether they will remain very similar like the ordinary aliphatic or aromatic carboxylic acids or whether the amine will remain uh, will have similar basicity like what is present in aliphatic or aromatic amines. So, that is the question. Now, what happens here in this case the uh, just let me change the page. Yes. So, what happens here that if you take an amino acid I think last time we did little bit of it and place it into an acidic solution say pH 1 then this is the form that it is going to take. We are talking we are thinking that this R is a neutral group is a hydrophobic group it does not have any acid or basic group uh, considering that. So, this will be present as NH 3 plus and CO 2 H. Now, if you start raising the pH to, to a certain level. So, at some point of time now this molecule has two dissociable hydrogens one is this carboxy another is this NH 3 plus. So, NH 3 plus can go to NH 2 and CO 2 H can go to CO 2 minus, but since this is the uh, stronger acid. So, first this what that will be lost. So, that ionization will take place and this will be R. Okay. Now, suppose the equilibrium constant for this uh, is expressed in terms of p k a. What is p k a? That is the dissociation constant of this carboxylic acid, because you have a proton that is generated. Okay. And dissociation constant remember is an equilibrium constant of this uh, of this process the negative logarithm of the equilibrium constant that is the dissociation constant. Okay. Lower p k a means uh, higher strength higher acid strength. Okay. So, as you raise the p h you have this uh, dissociation. So, it goes to a form interestingly where there is no charge the amount of positive and negative charge is same. Now, if you further increase the pH, then what happens? Then this NH3 plus that will lose the hydrogen and you have a second dissociation and the second dissociation will have a another dissociation constant. So, suppose this is p k 1 and we call it p k 2. Okay. So, this is what exactly happens as you raise the pH from a very acidic zone to say suppose up to pH 12. Now, this has got a net negative charge, this has got a net positive charge and this has got a net 0 charge. Okay. I told you last time that there is a pH a particular pH where this form is the is the dominant form is the form that is present and uh, which is electrically 
neutral which is counterbalanced. This is called the Zwitter ionic form and that pH is what is called the isoelectric point and the relation between isoelectric point means the pH at which it is electrically neutral is the average of this p k a 1 plus p k a 2. Now, the thing changes a little bit Achha, first before I go into this p i again the basic question I ask that what is the effect of this n h 3 plus on this C O 2 H or what is the effect of this C O 2 H on this N H on the N H 2 that means the basicity of this how do they interfere with each other. Now, if you we know that N H 3 plus is an electron withdrawing group or forget about N H 3 plus if you take this molecule only the normal N H 2 not the Zwitter ionic form and C O 2 H and R and now you ask yourself that what is the effect of this NH2 on this. Now, nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. So, now there will be an inductive effect on this side. If there is inductive effect on this side that will be transmitted to the second bond and that means, there is electron withdrawal this carbon is trying to pull electron from this carbon and what happens that will enhance the now that will facilitate it the release of the hydrogen from this. That means, if I have suppose a methyl R and then CO 2 H in case of methyl it is the other way around actually methyl pushes electrons on this side and that ultimately is transmitted to this carbon. In this case the opposite effect is happening and here if electron is pumping towards this carbon then there will be less tendency of this oxygen to release the hydrogen okay. because nobody wants that concentration of a charge on a particular atom the more delocalized it is that is better. So, this H will be released uh, will be released uh, at a pH which will be higher than uh, this hydrogen because this hydrogen release will be facilitated by the electron withdrawal of the nitrogen. So, what is the ultimate effect? The ultimate effect that the p k of the carboxylic acid will be lower than the normal p k of say acetic acid or propionic acid this type of aliphatic acids. So, the in amino acids alpha amino acids the carboxylic acid has a lower p k a and the same that means, the carboxylic acid is a stronger acid lower p k a means it is a stronger acid and in case of the N H 2 now for N H 2 we generate we talk about the basicity and when you talk about basicity we try to say that what happens to this dissociation means this is the p k a of N H 3 plus going to N H 2 what happens to that if that p k a is higher that means, its basicity is increasing if the p k is lower that means, its basicity is decreasing and acidity is increasing. Okay. So, now in this case what happens this is the carboxylic acid again we know if we just consider this structure carboxylic acid what it does it tries to withdraw electrons because this is a CO 2 H carbonyl is an electron withdrawing group. So, if it tries to withdraw electrons the chances that this lone pair will be donated to a proton will be will be less. So, that means, the basicity the basicity of the amine which depends on how easily this lone pair can be donated to a proton that that will be not that will be more difficult in the presence of a, an electron withdrawing group like carboxylic acid. So, ultimately what is happening the bottom line is that in alpha amino acids the carboxylic acid is more acidic that means, lower p k and the N H 2 is less basic. What does it mean? Again that means, that it will have a lower p k than the normal N H 2 say like methylamine or propylamine. Okay. 
I will show you the chart that of these different carboxylic acids and the amines how do they uh, what are their PKAs. Uh, we will go to that, but before that we will talk about a little bit about this R group and the isoelectric uh, point. Okay. Now, suppose there is a carboxy group now here in the side chain. So, how to know the what is the isoelectric point of this molecule. So, this is nothing but which is called aspartic acid. Now, aspartic acid if you take it in a acid medium like pH 1, then it will be present in this form N H 3 plus CO 2 H and CO 2 H. Now, what will happen if you try to raise the pH and alkali slowly, then one of these acids, these acids are stronger than the N H 3 plus. So, one of these acids will now lose proton, question is which acid will lose the proton first. Now, already in the previous uh, uh, previous not slide just the previously I just said that the alpha amino acid the carboxy group is the alpha carboxy group is stronger it, it, it is stronger acid than the normal aliphatic acids. So, so the first proton so that means this will have a lower pK than this one. So, as you raise the pH the first dissociation will happen from this carboxylic group. So, that will become CO 2 minus and that will be CO 2 H. Okay. So, this is the first dissociation. The second one I am not writing the proton it is basically plus and H plus. Okay. The second dissociation now will occur from the other carboxylic group. Okay. So, 2 minus and then this is N H 3 plus and this is CO 2 minus okay, plus H plus, but still you have one more acidic proton. So, if you do that again raise the pH suppose pH 12 to make sure that suppose you do not know what is the pKa of this N H 3 plus, but generally the pKa cannot go beyond for this amines usually the highest pKa is what is for guanidine which is around uh, 12 or 13. Okay. So, that is why I am uh, saying that suppose the pH is raised to 12, then what will happen? Surely, this is going to lose the hydrogen and you get CO minus. Okay. So, these are the three dissociations that you have. So, now you have pKa1, pKa2 and you have pKa3. Okay. Now, uh, so calculate the charges of each species. In this case you have a net positive charge. In this case you have the Zwitter ion 0. In this case you have a net negative charge 2 negatives and 1 positive. So, 1 negative charge and in this case 2 negative charges. Okay. So, now what will be the isoelectric point P i. Now, the P i will be basically P i is taken as the average of the two p k values on the left and right side of the neutral form or of the Zwitter ionic form. Now, the Zwitter ionic form is this one. Okay. So, this is the Zwitter ionic form uh, excluding the H sorry excluding the H this is the Zwitter ionic form and on the left is the unipositive one and on the right is the uni negative one. So, p i will be half of p k a 1 plus p k a 2. So, this is your p i interestingly the third dissociation constant does not take part in the formula of the p i. Okay. Now, take the other type of amino acid where there is a basic side chain, okay. you will see exactly the reverse of what we have seen earlier. That in case of aspartic acid it is the average of the first two dissociations the pKs and in case of basic amino acids where you have a basic group here like this is what is called 
let me count the carbons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So, this is NH 3 plus, this is the lysine in the fully protonated form, when pH is say again pH, suppose pH is approximately 1. So, this is what is lysine, it will be present in that form. Now, if you raise the pH again, now you do not have any problem that there are not, there are only one, there is only one carboxy group. So, that is what is going to ionize. So, you will get NH 3 plus and this will be CO minus and that will be 6 carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and that will be NH 3 plus. Okay. Next, you again raise the pH. So, now you have a dissociation constant here and in a p k value of this carboxy group that is p k a 1. So, that belongs to this p carboxy group. Then as you raise the p h, now the question you have to decide that there are two acidic hydrogens here, this is N H 3 plus that is also N H 3 plus. So, which one will come first? Now, we said we have already told that this amine, this amine becomes less basic in a in an alpha amino acid because of the carboxylic group, withdrawal of the carboxylic group. If it is less basic, that means this is more basic, you have to just go step by step. If it is less basic, that means its hydrogens is more acidic. So, these hydrogens are more acidic, why? Because this amine is less basic. Okay. So, this is the hydrogen that is going to be lost in H 2 and C O O minus and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, yeah. this is N H 3 plus and this dissociation constant will be uh, P K A 2. And now, you have another hydrogen which can be dissociated. So, you raise the pH and that will be the p k a 3, p k a 3 means the, the p k a 3 means the this is for p k a 2 and p k a 3 is for this ammonium species. So, that will be N H 2 and then you have C O O minus and then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right. So, because you have to always count because lysine has 6 carbon, uh, 6 carbons including the carboxy. So, this is the all the 3 forms now. So, now you just count the charges. This has got 2 positive charges, this has got 1 positive charge, this has got no charge 0. So, that is the zuterion and this has got a negative charge. Okay. Now, what did I say last time? I said that to know the p i of a or to calculate the p i of a system, what you do? You first consider which is the zuterion. Now, this is your zuterion okay. and then you take the p k values from the left side and from the right side. So, now in this case p i will be half of p k 2 plus p k a 3. Okay. I think this should be clear to you. Now, this is very important because this is only we are talking about amino acids. If we have a now peptide, a dipeptide or a tripeptide where there are different ionizable groups. So, that will also have an isoelectric point. An isoelectric point is very important because this is related to the movement of the system in an electric field. So, if you want to separate 3 molecules which have got 3 different p i's, so you can separate them in a by applying a voltage and then keeping the p h at certain point where one amino acid does not move that means that p h is at the p i kept at p i where the other amino acid will move uh, because that will have some charges because its p i does not match with the p h. So, p i is a very important concept in peptide chemistry, even amino acid separation, peptide protein separation. Okay. Now, this let us just show some of these slides very quickly. Uh, 
the amino acids of proteins, amino acids are zooterions I have already told you and this is the C alpha as it is shown here C alpha and that is connected to R. This is the L configuration in the Fisher projection formula L is the one where the amine group is on the left lower in the, in the left side of the vertical bond and uh, the carboxy should be at the top because Fisher projection formula demands that the number one carbon or the more oxidized most oxidized carbon should be kept at the vertical position at the top of the vertex. Okay. So, it says alpha carboxyl groups have p k is near 2.2 you know what is the p k of acetic acid it is about 4.7. So, you see that it is so much acidic See, so, always remember that these points, this is logarithmic scale. So, if there is a jump of one unit, that means that becomes 10 times more acidic or less acidic. So, that that also should be kept in mind because sometimes we forget. If we say that something has a pK of 4, another is 3, we think that they are pretty close, actually not close, one is 10 times more acidic than the other because it is a logarithmic scale. Okay. And then you see this L amino acid is different chirality. I have talked about chirality that these are all L and that translates into S except cysteine. Cysteine is the uh, is the R amino acid. L cysteine is R amino acid. D amino acid now this is a very uh, global question that why nature has picked up only the L, L amino acids and not the D amino acids. Now, uh, we are not trying to tell anything here about the reason because all are speculations, but one thing I will just point out because you may face different types of interviews and vivas where it might be asked to you that are all naturally occurring amino acids or belong to the L series or not. Again I repeat the question whether all naturally occurring amino acids belong to L series or not. The answer is that a majority is L, but there are instances where amino acids can be D. And when we talk about again bacterial cell wall structure, we will see that bacteria in order to survive itself from the onslaught of from the outside agents, it has made some amino acids which are in D configuration. So, that when there is D configuration, uh, the uh, it cannot be recognized by the foreign organism, okay. but that is a very interesting point. So, some D amino acids are there, it is not totally excluded. Okay. So, I think that is um, then this chirality, I will just want to make one more point that is why chirality is so important. Classification those I have already told you non-polar amino acids, then the polar uncharged all these classifications are there. Um, this is the other thing which also is very important although you may seem to be a uh, little bit uh, annoying that you have to know how to write the what are the symbols of these amino acids like for elements we have symbols. Okay. We have symbols H for hydrogen uh, everything has a symbol Na is sodium. So, in case of amino acids which are 20 in number. Uh, so, we have na names of that amino acids glycine, alanine, proline etcetera. Okay. But remember if suppose I want to ask you to write a structure of a decapeptide, okay. then how to write this decapeptide? So, you have to write alanine, then suppose valine, then again alanine, then glycine. So, your whole page cannot accommodate just a single decapeptide if you start writing the full word of the amino acid. So, what is the option then? We have to have some option to really have some symbols for these amino acids. Okay. Then came people started thinking of it a three letter word okay. like glycine was G L Y, alanine was A L A, okay. proline P R O, but still these three letter words again if there are 30 amino acids then there is a problem how to write this 30 amino acids in a single uh, in the width of a single page that becomes really difficult and 30 is a small number. Some amino acids are hundreds or two hundreds or even much more number of amino acids some proteins are like that. 
a big number of amino acids. So, ultimately people decided that IU, IUB that is the International Union, Union of Biologists, they have said that one will have to use this one letter code for the amino acids just like our elements the periodic table that we have. The elements have a symbol, the amino acids also have a symbol. However, there is a slight problem here. The problem is that there are many amino acids. If you take the first word of the amino acid as the symbol, you will see there are degeneracy like there is G, glycine is G and then glutamic acid is also G. So, now which one will get the G? So, it has been decided that first you start with this glycine is G, alanine is A, P is proline no problem first letter gives the symbol valine is V, leucine is L, isoleucine is I. Now, th the problem starts tryptophan, tryptophan is W, tryptophan is W because there is another T somewhere that is thre threonine, threonine we have given the T already reserved for threonine. So, tryptophan is W okay. and then phenylalanine, but you have already given P to proline. So, phenylalanine the as if the pronunciation is starts with phenyl, phenyl means as if you are starting with F. So, they said that okay, let us put F for phenylalanine. Okay. Methionine is M, no problem and then you have serine S, threonine T as I said, cysteine C, no problem. Aspartic acid is again is a asparagine is a problem because alanine has got the A, you have reserved A for alanine. So, asparagine is N and then glutamine is Q. Now, they say that glutamine some people in the uh, English world they say glutamine means they do not say glutamine. So, as if there is a, a, a phonetic sound of Q there. So, that is why they say glutamine is Q and then tyrosine is Y. They say they took the second word of tyrosine the second letter sorry the second letter of tyrosine that is Y and then you have histidine H lysine K R is because lysine you have already reserved L for leucine. So, lysine is K and then arginine pronunciation is like R, arginine. So, you have R, these are as I said the mnemonic device, arginine if you forget try to again think arginine means R as you have starting to pronounce it. So, that gives R, aspartic acid uh, some people in the in the English world again they say aspartic acid, they do not actually put stress on the T as if there is a D aspartic acid. So, the D is for aspartic acid and glutamate means glutamic acid is E. Now, this is uh, you must remember this 20 symbols, once you have this one letter now it is easy to write the 30 will be completed within few few dimensions. Okay. So, this is the way the amino acids are, uh, are represented when you want to know the sequence of amino acids in a peptide chain. Okay. So, that I wanted to say and then uh, this I have already told these are different how to do the PKIs, PIE values how to know that. This I want to show you the importance of this chirality, the chirality is very important our we say that our biological world is a L world means means it is made of L, L amino acids. Uh, there is whether there is a D world somewhere in the universe that is a debatable thing, uh, but the this L is very important. If you have a drug which is chiral and if you take a mixture of L and D, then the question is our body is chiral, all the materials are chiral and they have L configuration and the sugars have D configuration. So, now there will be different type of interactions with the drug. So, even if I take a drug in the in the chira in the racemic form, I have two different L and D forms of the drug and the interactions of the drug with the molecules in our body will be different because one who knows stereochemistry coming from organic chemistry background, we know that if I have a drug which is a plus and a minus drug, if the plus drug interacts with the L protein protein made up of L amino acids and the, min the plus minus compound interacts with the 
with the same protein the interactions will be different. Sometimes the interactions may be extremely dangerous and there was one incident there was a drug which was called thalidomide which has got a, a chiral center at this carbon and it was sold as a racemic mixture and when it was given to uh, pregnant women and then the babies born from them the babies most of the babies you see they do not have developed organs like the hands are not there some legs are missing uh, some and uh, even it is not shown here some of these uh, fingers are also missing in the hands and also in the legs these are called teratogenic compounds. So, this shows the importance of chirality that is why uh, whenever we make a peptide whenever we try to make something a protein or peptide a new molecule we must uh, focus our attention on to chirality also. Okay. Thank you.